Hello, and welcome to the webinar. This event is part of the Meet the Cloud Architects series in partnership with Druva and AWS. On this event, you'll meet the cloud architects and they'll be talking about AWS cloud reliability best practices. This is going to be a really cool video panel discussion with experts from Druva and AWS. Thank you so much for joining us. Before I introduce you to today's expert presenters, there's just a few things that you should know about the webinar. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as the moderator. We encourage your questions during the event, and experts from Druva are standing by to respond. We also have a number of resources available there in the Handouts tab, specifically links to druva.com and the AWS Well-Architected Framework, which we'll be discussing on the webinar. And finally, at the end of the presentation today, I'll be announcing the winner of the Amazon $300 gift card to one lucky prize winner. If you're watching this on demand, of course, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab. On today's event, we'll also be doing a best question prize where you can win a $50 Amazon gift card just for submitting a question on the event. We'll contact the prize winner after the presentation today. All prize winners must meet the actual tech media prize policy. And with that, I'm excited to introduce you to today's expert presenters. They are David Gildia, Vice President of Products at Druva, Tony McGarry, Senior Principal Engineer at Druva, Pallavi Thakur, Principal Engineer at Druva, and special guest, Abhijit Karodi, Senior Solutions Architect from AWS. So with that, let's kick it off and get started. Hi everyone. Uh, today we're working on the reliability pillar of the well Active Protected Framework. And with me today we have uh, Abhijit Karodi uh, from Amazon. We have Pallavi uh, Thakkar from Druva and Tony McGarry from Druva as well. So uh, Abhijit, would you like to introduce yourself? Definitely. Uh, hi, this is Abhijit Karodi. I'm the Senior Solutions Architect at uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, my focus area is especially ISVs such as Druva. Uh, I help uh, ISV's engineer solutions on AWS. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that, Apajit. Uh, Pallavi, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Pallavi Thakur. I'm a principal engineer at Druva. Uh, and uh, my area of interest and my domain of work is uh, the cloud file system that Druva has. Uh, it's a large scale uh, distributed cloud file system, uh, and it's common for both of our Druva products in Sync and Phoenix. Great. Thank you for that, Pallavi. And uh, Tony, uh, for those who haven't met you, do you want to introduce yourself again? Sure, I'm Tony. I'm one of the uh, senior architects for Druva, particularly in the um, cloud engine product, and I specialize in serverless technologies. Great, thanks for that. So, uh, and finally, myself, my name is David Gildi, and I'm a VP of product here at Druva, uh, and I manage the, the Amazon workloads products uh, here at Druva. So to give everyone a sense for what it is that we're doing here, the idea of this Meet the Cloud Architect series is to talk through the well-architected framework that Amazon have developed uh, and bring some experts on board to help us understand exactly what's the benefits, you know, why you should look at the well-architected framework uh, and how it helps you design and build SaaS applications on Amazon. Uh, and with that in mind, you know, having, having experts like uh, Abhijit, uh, Tony and Pallavi here with us, we've got some great uh, opportunities to learn and get some experience from the applications they've developed at scale and the benefits of using the well-architected framework to help understand how you should do that and some of the pitfalls on Amazon. So uh, Abhijit, it would be great if you could maybe take a couple of minutes and just talk us through the theory of the, uh, the well-architected framework and the reliability pillar, if you don't mind. Definitely. Uh, thank you, David. Um, so if you think about it, right, uh, the AWS well-architected framework helps you understand the pros and cons of the decisions you make while building workloads on AWS. Uh, basically, while using this framework, you will learn architectural best practices for designing and operating uh, your workloads on the cloud. As you mentioned, David, there are various pillars to the well architect framework at, uh, at AWS. Uh, there are five pillars to name them. Operational excellence, which is more focused on automation of your infrastructure and taking care of those uh, parts of the uh, infrastructure. Then you have the security pillar and the main intent of the security pillar is to prevent harm to your data and to your infrastructure. Then comes performance efficiencies. Performance is another pillar where you try to make a performant workload and minimize the latencies you have at various uh, uh, touch points and various uh, endpoints you have. 
then comes the pillar of cost optimization while doing all the other uh, taking care of all the other uh, pillars you also have to make certain design trade off to see that your uh, design is cost optimized and you have, have a uh, you know you take care of that pillar too then we come to the pillar uh, the pillar which of the well architect framework we want to talk today is reliability reliability um, the pillar encompasses a work basically the ability of a workload to perform its intended function correctly and consistently when it's intended to so no matter what load it has no matter what uh, time of the day it is time of the year it is what you're doing it should perform its function reliability workload if you uh, think about it, it depends on several factors it, it it kind of depends on the other pillars too but primarily it depends on something we call as resiliency so resiliency in turn uh, is the ability of the workload to recover from infrastructure or service disruptions uh, to dynamically acquire computing resources so it can meet demands or dynamically scale down also it, it should be able to mitigate disruptions it should be able to uh, uh, respond to misconfigurations some transient network issues that's resiliency now one would wonder how would uh, you measure resiliency to measure resiliency we do uh, by availability so availability is the metric by which you measure your resiliency um, let me give you an example if you somebody says that hey you know what availability is five nines so we have this all these nine uh, you you may be hearing in durability and other concepts availability has five nines so finance kind of means that your the system which you have designed and oper operating on aws will be not available only 5 minutes of the whole year it has been operating so that's a pretty high standard to have and you need to have a design operations design and the implementation and operations which will support those uh, uh, that kind of slas now achieving reliability right can be a traditional uh, in your traditional on premises can be challenging aws and the cloud in, as in the uh, model as such allows you to achieve those kind of high availability numbers now to do that the well architect framework talks about certain design principles uh, from their principles uh, sort kind of uh, they are around automating your recovery they are around uh, scaling horizontally they are around stop allowing not, not allow you to guess capacity and then again these design principles you can apply in specific focus areas namely the areas are foundations so the, when we talk about the foundation infrastructure it's mostly aws the networking part of it uh, the global infrastructure of aws the storage part of it which aws takes it and the compute part of it with the wide variety and the wide options available and we'll go uh, i believe uh, uh, in detail as we go along the second focus area is the workload architecture which was recently introduced and very it's a very key thing to understand your workload architecture is going to um, uh, talk a lot about resiliency how resilient your whole system is how have you uh, designed your services have you applied the service design principles the microservices uh, principles have you applied domain driven design have you kind of decomposed your whole uh, business domain into several small domains uh, for example if you think of amazon.com you can think of pricing products and payment and the whole shipping part of it completely different domains and they they can they need to be architected separately they need to be taken their own rpo and rto uh, point in, in in consideration they need to have their own circuit breakers and other uh, other components which will which will work with that architecture then comes the focus areas of change management one thing is going on in the cloud is constant change there are things deploy getting deployed there are configuration changes happening there are deployments of each of these microservices happening through canary through blue green all those sorts of deployments you should be able to automatically respond to those things and make sure that your uh, your workload is uh, performing as 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 the function is lastly come to the uh, uh, focus area of failure management one thing is guaranteed in any systems on premises or on the cloud is failure now you need to have your systems designed and operated in such a way that they will take care of this infra failures um you also need to think in consideration about the data part of it and what amount of data you're allowed to kind of uh, 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 you know lose and you should be recovering from that point so i think um, throughout this next hour we'll 
talk about all these design principles, especially into these focus areas. Excellent. Thank you for that, Abhijit. Um, it, it strikes me that reliability, particularly with the evolution of, of AWS coming out of Amazon, where they have such an e-commerce platform and every, every minute that the platform may be down costs a significant amount of money. Is this something that was always key to um, the Amazon Web Services that came out of, of Amazon? Is, is reliability just such a core concern for Amazon? Absolutely. So uh, Amazon, if I gave the example of Amazon.com and over the years of multiple decades, the, the well-architected framework has come from all that experience. And this particular, especially this pillar, so when you're monitoring, so we, we talked about um, uh, foundational services as well as we talked about some of the things from the infrastructure monitoring perspective. Um, that monitoring is also needs to happen from a business context that, as you said, how much of the time can I afford to for the system or this microservices not available and the dollar impact of that and, the, and kind of uh, design back from there to achieve what infrastructure you want and how much redundancy you want to uh, plan in the infrastructure. Excellent, okay. Uh, and Palavi, I strike, again, uh, you might be able to give us a sense for, you know, as Drupal goes through that discussion, when you're designing a system, is, is it always that cost uh, versus reliability trade-off that you, yes, you could have, you know, um, many, many versions of databases sitting everywhere, but obviously costs you money and you're trying to, you know, is that a balance that you're always yeah. trying to strike? Yeah, yeah. So uh, cogs versus uh, reliability is like always uh, uh, a thing to balance uh, in case of uh, the cloud file system that we have at Druva. So I can give you an example of this. So uh, basically provisioning DynamoDB uh, service. So most of our metadata, so we almost have one petabyte of uh, metadata stored in uh, AWS DynamoDB. So we need to provision DynamoDB sufficiently uh, so that uh, basically uh, there are no failures. So there are no provision throughput errors. So uh, when it comes to this, uh, uh, reliable uh, DynamoDB provisioning is the most important uh, thing there. Gotcha, okay. <laughs> and, um, designing systems at scale, obviously the scale that, that Drupal operates at. Yeah. Reliability yeah. It has to be such a key concern, right? Yeah. So one interesting thing uh, that we have done there is uh, we do trend-based tuning for uh, the DynamoDB service. Uh, so the way this trend-based tuning works is that uh, depending on the work day as well as time uh, in that particular day. So for example, if it is morning time uh, in a given AWS region, that is the typical time uh, when we see uh, very high amount of load for our in-sync uh, product. Uh, whereas when it is uh, nighttime, uh, it, we see a very high surge of load for our Phoenix product because it's a server workload. Uh, so generally server backup works to off peak hours of the customer. So uh, what we do is we provision DynamoDB slightly beforehand uh, so that uh, there are no uh, immediate throttles. So basically a provision mm -hmm. throughput error uh, is a throttle which kind of causes a task failure for us, for Drua. So we don't want backup tasks or restore tasks. So uh, restore failures are even more crucial than backup because backups work on a cycle and restores are uh, like they have to always work without failure for a customer. So trend-based tuning helps greatly in this way is that based on the time of the day and the past history of DynamoDB usage for that particular time of the day, we provision uh, the tables say five minutes beforehand of the expected load. So uh, that makes uh, the provisioning sufficient as well as it doesn't cost us too much. So flatly provisioning tables would uh, cost us a lot. Uh, whereas uh, kind of slightly provisioning them uh, beforehand based on historical pattern is something that has helped us make our uh, applications on all the metadata requests uh, reliable. So, okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Hey, Tony, what's your, uh, I suppose, how do you think about reliability when you're designing the likes of the Cloud Ranger application and, and SaaS, uh, SaaS apps on Amazon? So Palavi makes a, a very good point on, on when it comes to data, it's very hard to avoid the costs that come, you know, with you know, having to have multiple redundancy, having to provision for, you know, reads, et cetera. But when it comes to, um, you know, the, the CPU or the processors and, and, you know, the other components that make up your, your system as a whole, 
I think when it comes to reliability, I always have this um, tendency to look at what does Amazon offer? Um, particularly, what does it offer in terms of a, of a managed service? Um, so, like historically, you have people who would come onto the cloud and they'd be looking at, I need to move my workload from on premises to, to the cloud. And the first thing they might see is that they're, they're running like some uh, RD, RDBMS systems or they're running them inside VMs. And they might just decide to lift those VMs and put them straight into EC2. Mm -hmm. So essentially, then they're running their um, their MySQL or the Postgres or whatever inside VMs. Now, the thing that they're missing out is that you know Amazon already has this RDS service, which has a whole slew of um, you know reliability um, features available that come out of the box. So like, the, not only is the service like managed in that it's you know Amazon has its own monitoring done in the background, it offers its own you know, multi-AZ feature, it offers, um, you know, ro rolling um, availability in, in the case of failures. There's a, you know, you can, you can trigger failovers, you can, um, you can simulate failovers, etc. So all those features come out of the box with the service. And when I look at, you know, what if I'm building a system, I always say what's available in Amazon today before I decide, you know, I'm just going to lift and shift something. Um, and then the other thing I would look at is, in terms of the responsibility model for reliability, you know, Amazon has adopted a lot when it comes to these managed services. So they'll have taken over the control of the, the reliability of certain features. So we typically build serverless solutions. You know, Amazon is responsible for the reliability, the provisioning of those functions, the systems that it runs on, the networking of them, et cetera. We might configure them, but they're, they're responsible for the reliability. Which means if you look back at the VM type of world where you know you're running instances in your on-prem or you're running them <clears> in EC2, then you're you're responsible for you know system failures, patching of those systems, making sure the OS is up to date. That's all on on your on your side of the of the table. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Just so to add to what on. Tony was saying, yeah. just to add to what Tony was saying that um, the undifferentiated heavy lifting that's that's something you know Amazon and Amazon has still provided. And that comes into the, uh, the best practices areas of our foundation. So you can take the foundations area. We talked about networking storage compute, and we just kind of had abstractions of RDS and managed services. So that's a very, very important point, Tony. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, the Simpsons cartoon when Homer went to run for mayor, and he, uh, his slogan was, can somebody else do it? And it sounds like that with <laughs> a lot of these reliability features, you, know, you, you want uh, Amazon to look after that for you. Um, it does strike me, though, that you do need to understand what they're doing for you um, and, and to the point of the shared responsibility model. What is Amazon doing for you and what are they not doing for you that you still need to understand? Uh, so even if Amazon is doing that undifferentiated heavy lifting, uh, that you understand what they're doing so you, you don't miss anything. Absolutely. And I think that's part of the general conversation then here is, is how does the well-architected framework help you identify you know, what Amazon is doing for you and what they're not and where you need to design your application to cater for that. Um, so with that in mind, uh, you know, the part of the series is that we're trying to describe how to build a SaaS application on AWS using the well-architected framework to design that. And what we've done is we've evolved this idea of an airline application through the series so far. And uh, just the, the idea being that it's, it's like a, a, a fresh application putting the, the well-architected framework through its paces uh, around how we might help design this airline application. So Tony, do you want to just walk us through uh, a high level about the airline application, maybe uh, how we've got to this stage and then some of the considerations that you have in place when it comes to reliability. Sure. Um, yeah, so you, you've seen this in the past, um, this, this diagram that we've done for the airline application. And when it comes to the um, reliability here, the, the first thing you'll notice is that we've, we've mirrored this application across two regions. So we've, we've immediately been thinking of, you know, a couple of scenarios is one is like, can, can we deal with like a, potential full region outage, but, but also can we deal with things like just, um, you know, additional capacity should we need it? You know, we might have peaky workloads, et cetera. We might have um, the case where we want to do a release, perhaps you want to do, um, you know, blue green deployments, things like that. So um, we've had that in mind and, and we sort of built around that idea. And then there's reliability in, in all different layers of this application. So from the top down, um, we're using Route 53 for our DNS. And by using Route 53, we, we've adopted like sort of the reliability of 
Amazon in this case, and that we just configure it and they're responsible for the service. So um, it, does, it does mean that we're single point sensitive on, on Route 53, but it can be replaced by, ex, by external DNS if, if, if required. In terms of um, our front for our, our, our cache for our website, we've used the CloudFront service. And again, it allows us to give um, you know, um, regional, region or, or global coverage for the cache of our, of our site. So we can have it split across the whole world and have people have the, the best experience when it comes to using the website. Um, as we get lower and deeper into the, the networking structure, you can see that the, as we mirror the services out, but there's actually more responsibility the further you go down. So as we go down to um, API Gateway, which is again, it's an Amazon service that allows us to um, provision our API and have it again available across multiple regions as, as regional or global endpoints. But when we get down towards the VPC and the subnet layer, it becomes more of our responsibility to configure our compute, in this case, our, our serverless functions and have them available in um, different subnets. So a multi-subnet deployment for reliability in the case of subnet outage. Uh, and again, we have that split across multiple regions. So we have the ability to you know, turn off one region and operate on a single region basis. Going deeper, um, down towards our storage and as uh, Abhijit was pointing out er earlier, um, having domain-based control within our system, we've separated some of the um, messaging within the system and some of the control within the system by using uh, SQS as, as a, a messaging system and a, and a barrier between where we can offload certain compute, not hold up part of the compute model for handling the, the website or handling in this case, perhaps processing tickets or, or doing searches for, for airline tickets. And we can offload perhaps the messaging and the email um, into a queue, which can be processed at a, you know, at a different priority. <clears throat> then we have our, um, our DynamoDB database, which we're using as a store. And in this case, we're using um, a, a, global, a global DynamoDB table, which is, um, we, we've decided, it's not mentioned here, but we've decided to provision this uh, as a on-demand DynamoDB table, which allows us to have the best of both worlds in terms of cost and uh, scalability. Yeah, excellent. Thanks for that, Tony. Uh, Abhijit, if I could ask, one thing that strikes me is I look at my own evolution of development and design from you know, 20 years ago in a big financial company doing designing applications, the idea of cross-region or cross-AZ never came into conversations, really. That was always handled by someone else off in the distance and you and you just assume that something like that was done. How are you seeing evolutions for, for your own customers now in Amazon, you know, making that change? Is, is it just second nature now that you do talk about cross AZ, cross region, or that that's the default for people who are starting off developing applications? Yeah, so when we talk to our customers, right? I mean, we have seen this that achieving high levels of availability in terms and making your workloads reliable uh, in an on-premise environment, it's, it's very challenging. And as you mentioned, with the global infrastructure of Amazon Web Services, so within uh, within your region, you can uh, basically split your microservices. In this case, uh, the way Tony explained uh, in his uh, airline reservations architecture, you split your web services across multiple AZs and get that amount of uh, kind of resiliency within that region. If you if you have want to have further levels of resiliency that you are want to account for a region failure, you kind of have a workload which can work, which is also deployed into other regions, and we see this and this can be done in minutes. This this deployments models are not something you have to plan for. So that again go I go on to go back to the design principle of stop guessing capacity and on an on premises environment you have to plan for that infrastructure on AWS with the regions, with the AZs, with the on-demand availability, you basically add and remove your uh, uh, compute or other kind of services on demand and you know test it out for each workload. That particular uh, functionality you cannot have on your on-premises and that more and more customers we have seen understanding that over the years and doing uh, the making their uh, their applications and workloads more resilient by using the AWS constructs of uh, AZs, regions, and other uh, managed services. 
Okay, excellent. Uh, that's a good segue in actually to, you know, to the best practices as we look at talking about the, the five best practices with reliability, foundations, workload architecture, change management, and failure management. Um, you know, if we just start with the reliability piece, I know um, Palavi, you talked about the likes of trend-based tuning uh, that you've had yeah. to put in place for, for DynamoDB at Juva. Um, could, could you just, I'm not sure, do you have any particular figures or anything that you could share with us to give us a sense for the scale of what, uh, what you've operated at? Yeah, so uh, the metadata is basically one petabyte, but it is distributed in, uh, say, around 10 to 12 AWS regions. So we offer uh, Drua services in around 10 to 12 uh, AWS regions for both InSync and Phoenix uh, products. And uh, the provisioning for uh, some tables, uh, which are, say, uh, like around uh, multiple terabytes in size. So that we have few tables which are like... Uh, like tens, twenties, uh, or even 50 uh, terabytes in size. Uh, the provision can be as high as say a million IOPS uh, for read and write. So uh, that is how high it can go. Uh, so uh, the cost is also significant because we have uh, that much storage. So for reliability, uh, of course we do uh, auto scaling. So auto scaling, we use a Drua variant of auto scaling, as I mentioned earlier, because we want to balance cogs. But another very good alternative that AWS provides is on-demand scaling. So for our, our in-house clouds, we do actually use that because that is very, very convenient to use. Uh, so although not exactly at the level of some custom auto-tuning, so some applications like us have some custom needs, but even on-demand auto scaling that AWS provides is it works beautifully for our in-house uh, workloads. Uh, and uh, so this was about DynamoDB, but uh, like we also uh, do, so as uh, Abhijit mentioned earlier, so AWS provides various uh, services for uh, basically tailoring your application so that uh, they are basically uh, reliable. Uh, another very uh, good feature of AWS that we use for our EC2 instances is we use auto scaling groups for most of our services. And in those auto scaling groups, there's a feature called as scheduled scaling. So which again uh, allows us to set the desired um, EC2 count, the instance count uh, in each region based on time. So uh, that is another feature, uh, in-house feature, which is very convenient to use uh, that allows us uh, to basically adjust the load uh, very uh, effectively. Okay, excellent. And Abhijit, from your perspective, um, you know, the, the theory of the reliability framework, would you mind just recapping that and then we can talk through how it relates to the, the um, application we're designing? Yeah, so, so in the context of the application we're designing, right, I mean, um, Tony talked about the land visiting systems. So um, if you want to take out design principles of the well-architected framework and apply to that reservation, uh, up to that airline system, um, you need to, first of all, focus on recovery of the failure, right? It, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe we have uh, shown that uh, diagram in our earlier sessions. So each of that Lambda uh, microservice is independent of each other. So let's say you have a reservation kind of microservice and a payment microservice, they are independently uh, evolved. Now, what needs to be done is to monitor that the work, those workloads based on the business KPIs. Uh, let me give you an example on that, that let's say you have a payment system within that airline reservation, that needs to be highly available. You, you can't, from a business KPI perspective, you can't afford to go down for a long period of time. And then you have a notification microservices. So notification microservices may have a completely different kind of a business KPI and, over there. You can test out, um, uh, so for the following the design principle, you, could, you need to uh, introduce failure into those services and see how the, your design responds to it. Uh, as Pallav was saying, if you, use uh, managed services which have which have the ability and the, and the tools and techniques like ASG or that auto screen groups. And in Lambda, there are other mechanisms for that to scale out and scale in for that thing. Uh, one thing we kind of also want to see is, is change. That uh, whatever changes you're making and whatever changes you're planning to make, it to make automate those changes. So within the context of that airline resilient systems, if you plan to uh, have your infrastructure deployed, make sure your, the deployment and the changes are also automated. So that's something some of the uh, design principles you have to keep in mind 
with the focus of today's discussion of the airline reservation systems or the airline system. Gotcha. Okay. Um, uh, Tony, if you think about the, the figures that Palavi gave us there, which are just phenomenal. I mean, we talk about uh, a, a data store that's a petabyte in size. Uh, that's a significant amount of data to try and manage and, and keep resilient. Uh, the workload architecture component of that and designing you know, a, a DynamoDB versus data, data store versus the likes of a, a relational data store as an example, like MySQL, where you can manage that scale. Um, how, you know, is, that, is that the approach that's a kind of serverless approach that you've taken in the architecture uh, that we've looked at here? Yeah, so we, we specifically avoided um, using an RDS structure for the design that we built for the reservation system. Using Lambda against an RDBMS is always going to have issues when you get to a certain scale around, you're still instance driven in RDS. So how many connections can you handle with that, um, with that database coming from a Lambda based system, which is, you know, the ability to scale up very fast. It could trigger a lot of connections. It might be very short lived connections, et cetera. Now there's, there's services that have um, come into play from, from AWS, such as the RDS proxy which can sort of alleviate a little, bit of, a little bit of that. But I think DynamoDB is more geared towards um, the, you know, the type of database we want for this sort of request-driven um, architecture. So it's a, you know, it's a HTTP type interface. So you know, it's gonna deal with requests as you know, Pallavi mentioned based on our provisioning. So we, we can provision for a certain, certain amount of IOPS uh, reads and writes. And you know, using the stats we can learn from um, CloudWatch, watching our you know our invocations of particular functions, we can provision the database appropriately. So definitely, you know, the, that's where it comes down to, you know, choosing the right tool for for the job. In this case, you know, we're, the type of application we're building, the the database. There's many different database types, and you know, Amazon offers a lot of them. Um, you want to choose the right tool for the job. Yeah. I think just to add Tony that in this like whatever Tony said, rightly fits into our workload architecture focus area where Tony has uh, kind of broken down uh, the, uh, the, uh, the airline system into microservices and each of them have a specific requirement, right? So the database requirement for a, a something which is mostly configuration may be different than what you need for high throughput kind of transactions. I think that's that's very important to uh, understand as you follow the uh, guidelines set up in the well architected framework, especially in the reliability pillar. Gotcha. And Palavi, I mean, you, you mentioned previously about checkpointing uh, for spot instances. How, how does that come into your your uh, you know workload architecture planning when it comes to reliability? Uh, yeah, so uh, checkpointing is uh, very crucial when it comes to uh, running applications which uh, have long running jobs. So for example, there might be some background jobs which do consistency checks, or there might be jobs which uh, basically compact and delete uh, data that is no longer required. So uh, for such applications, running them on spot instances is very beneficial because uh, there is like a huge cost advantage there. But uh, at the same time, uh, because spot instances can basically go down uh, slightly more than regular EC2 instances, checkpointing is very crucial. So uh, basically uh, keeping all the state, the current state of the application periodically, flushing it to some kind of persistent store, which would be DynamoDB in our case is uh, extremely crucial. And that allows us to basically uh, avoid rework because we want the application to be reliable. We don't want it to lose state as well as we want it uh, to basically complete as fast as poss possible. So any background job, uh, we want to avoid any extra API calls for cost purposes. So basically checkpointing is something that really comes into the play. So uh, for uh, all the cloud application developers out there, so if uh, you have such lo long running jobs, uh, please consider checkpointing because uh, it would uh, like help save cogs as well as uh, make your application reliable. Okay, with that mind, is there is there any particular um, feature of spot instances that you'd like to see Amazon add that would, you know, help make things easier for you as a you know as a substantial user of uh, spot instances? Uh, yeah. So uh, in case of spot, of course, I mean, uh, if they can really increase the probability of them going down slightly more than EC two, 
So mm -hmm. that would be a huge advantage as well as uh, so CloudWatch. So as even Tony mentioned, and uh, like I forgot to mention earlier, but we do use CloudWatch extensively to basically monitor our applications as well as we use it for tuning. So the trend-based tuning that I mentioned earlier, uh, that is somewhere CloudWatch comes into play. So if uh, there could be a CloudWatch API out there, uh, which uh, provides some kind of indication that, okay, the spot instance might go down now in say next three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. So that would be kind of an interesting feature where we could like take some kind of app, uh, action in the application uh, to basically even checkpoint less frequently. So, okay, I hope Abhijit, you're take, taking notes to take back to the Amazon product manager. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Most of our uh, systems and uh, services are built from uh, feedback from customers like yours. So yes, yeah. well, we, I'll take it back to the drawing board. Yeah, one, yeah, thing, I think, um, one thing I think I, I really like about using Amazon Web Services and particularly individual services like DynamoDB as an example is Amazon have designed it to meet the most stringent use cases. So you get that by default whether you need that or not. Uh, so it's like the security as well. Amazon have had to make it secure enough that banks and governments can store data uh, on AWS. So you get that by default without having to consider and build your application necessarily with that in mind. So I think, you know, particularly with the reliability perspective, having that you know, built in by default is, is incredibly helpful. Um, when we think about change management, uh, Tony, and the application that we have, uh, you know, how would you approach change management uh, and you know, deployments, et cetera, using some of the Amazon tool sets to, you know, with reliability in mind? Yeah, I think I would sort of touched on this um, briefly um, in that, for us, when when you when you look at change management, you always want to go back to you know the, your the you know the the first tier you know where you know automate and um, you you want to keep everything as code you know so you want your whole infrastructure as code you want to automate your processes and when when change management comes into play you you, you want to be able to you know replicate change have it predictable um, and not have something that you a scenario that you weren't expecting um, and when it comes to, if you look at our architecture we built out for the airline system, a change that we introduce to region one, we want to make sure that we get that into region two, either even if it's by a blue green or whatever it is. So when it comes to making those changes, we want to make sure that the change is something that we have automated and we've we've scripted as code, not something that we've configured by chance and forgotten about. And we have one region that's you know behaving differently from another, and it doesn't have to all be a region; it could be something small. But just uh, you know, as a as an example, um, you know, you could, you could change the configuration for a DynamoDB table in one region and not realize that that's what's been holding the whole application up. And when you fail over to another region, um, that configuration change is missing, and now all of a sudden you have a you've, you've relied on that um, other failover scenario or failover um, just our, our deployment. And when you when you actually move to it, it's not going to behave the same as your as your primary. So it's it's very important that you know it's something that's that's traceable, um, something that's repeatable, and you, you have it as code so that when you when you need it, you, um, it's actually easy to deploy. Okay, how, how does Palavi? Uh, how does um, how do you manage you know deployment of, of code across those twelve regions you spoke about earlier for Amazon, whether it's changes to DynamoDB or actual code changes to your spot instances? Uh, yeah, so uh, we do have for DynamoDB, uh, the tuner that I talked about. Uh, so that basically runs uh, centrally in the region and it issues CloudWatch API calls. So uh, it is a centrally managed service and it runs on a dedicated EC2 instance, which is not spot uh, because we want uh, it to run uh, most of the times. Uh, other than that, uh, for spot instances, uh, the services are uh, pretty much managed uh, via like tools like Terraform and Salt. So uh, there is uh, no special extra management that we need that we do. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we use scheduled scaling and auto scaling groups and uh, all, all that mechanism. And we do have like uh, uh, ASG minimum, maximum desired counts. Uh, we also use uh, ECS. Uh, so, uh, in case of some services, we have ECS clusters which run on top of uh, EC2 spot in, uh, instances. So, uh, uh, basically, uh, the AWS CloudWatch and other uh, abilities uh, that services provide 
so they make uh, management uh, quite easy so uh, so okay. in, like in each aws regions we have like multiple clusters and we have uh, like at peak hours we have up to thousands of uh, instances running so mm. but the management is pretty easy just to add to tony and pallavi on the so on the reliability kind of pillar as such and change management focus area there is an intentional change and there is an unintentional change so a monitoring mechanism to uh, monitor your you know cloud watch and other mechanisms of your workloads for unintentional change so spot is a very good example pallavi you gave and uh, spot uh, depends on the demand of that particular instance type in that particular region and that can go up and down throughout the uh, kind of you know throughout the focus uh, period and then your workloads has mechanisms to kind of get that event and respond to it without impacting its functionality that's that's something reliability pillar talks about and then there is an intentional change you have a new version of the software you was you are introducing into your system and within that you want to have mechanisms like blue green or canary deployments through which you can manage change in a much more elegant manner without impacting the business functionality Okay, that actually leads really well in Abhijit to the, the final piece around failure management and what other <clears throat> unintentional changes uh, and we've seen in the last number of years the idea of the likes of Chaos Monkey from Netflix, you know, which is yeah. sort of going in and breaking parts of your infrastructure. Uh, is that something that you're starting to see, you know, take a foothold across a lot of customers? Absolutely. So uh, one thing you want to do with your, once you have designed, once you have implemented uh, from a reliability perspective and you're taking care of a lot of things, you need to test it out. You need to test it out for all your failure scenarios, uh, again, within the context of your business KPIs. You don't want to, you want to have microservices with certain availability objectives, certain uh, residency objectives, and you test it out for them. There are various mechanisms for that. And there is a whole kind of section dedicated in the well architected framework. We call it chaos engineering, which again, as you mentioned, David, is based on Netflix's experimentation with chaos monkey and you know chaos gorilla and you know there is a lot of uh, component a lot of uh, tools for that so introduce failures introduce uh, for az's uh, simulate az's going down simulate instances not coming up simulate uh, your network failure simulate uh, aws regional failures for certain services you know like uh, kinesis uh, firewalls something like that that fails so components within your system might fail and you need to be resilient about that. So that's something you have to uh, uh, keep in mind and the guide, uh, well architect framework provides you certain uh, kind of guidelines and certain prescription with chaos engineering. Um, one thing is the, the RPOs of, the, uh, of your workload. So the recovery point object is, so how much failure you can afford, that also needs to be considered. Okay, excellent. And, and Ajit, um, I, I would... I would add to that as well that it's, it's very important again that using the microservices and you know the separation of concerns really helps because then when you when you do have a failure scenario and you are at reduced capacity you can prioritize the workloads that you you need to prioritize and deprioritize others um you know given given the provision obviously that they're the ones that are not completely affected that you need to have as high, highest priority but it is having those systems um you know, separated having microservices, not only does it help you do that when it, when it comes, but it also helps you simulate it because you have circuit breakers in between that you can test and you can trip. So it, it comes, to, you know, it helps you test, it helps, it helps when it comes to an actual failover scenario. Um, it also helps understand your the different data you're dealing with and how your data can have different reliability. Yeah. A good example of that point could be only that, let's say in, a, in an e-commerce example again, where a customer has gone through the checkout cycle and has all the cart ready and the payment fails. And then your circuit breaker kind of shows an elegant way of that, hey, so there is a certain outage or something like that. And, but you don't lose your data within the cart. And that would be a very bad customer experience and the customer would leave. Yeah, so that's a very good point. Okay, uh, yeah, I suppose that, that kind of helps us wrap up, Tony, if that's your, your pro tip. Um, Halavi, would you give a, leave us with a pro tip as a uh, as some guidance for people who are watching this when it comes to reliability? If there was one line or two lines you'd give people, um, what would you say? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I would like to say that reliability is crucial. So uh, please uh, focus on reliability. 
uh, while trying to balance cost. So um, I think uh, reliability should be given uh, more focus because that is what uh, enhances the customer experience. Fantastic. And uh, Abhijit, any um, pro tip you'd like to leave with? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the, um, we talked about multiple times throughout the last half an hour, workload architecture. So spend time in that focus area, uh, decouple your whole system into uh, pieces which you could independently kind of deploy, manage, recover, uh, test, and make them resilient. So look at everybody. Th thanks a million for the conversation. I've really enjoyed uh, the chat about reliability. Uh, it's an incredibly important part of designing SaaS applications on Amazon. So um, you know, thank you to you all for, for joining and for giving your expertise and your insights. Hopefully everyone will have found it really helpful. Uh, so finally, guys, thank you very much for, for joining. I uh, appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you, David. Thank you so thanks, much. Everyone. All right, excellent discussion. Thank you so much to our experts from Druva and AWS. Uh, I learned a lot about AWS architecture and reliability best practices, really good talk today. So uh, we got a lot of great feedback as well in the questions box there. If you have any questions, there's still a few seconds to get those in and experts from Druva and AWS are standing by. Uh, I'll just uh, give you a few moments to ask those while I announce our Amazon $300 gift card winner. This gift card is going out to Benny Min from California. Congratulations, Benny Min from California. Of course, we'll also be contacting our best question prize winner after the event today. Um, everyone who was entered into the, the drawing when you ask a question automatically, as long as you meet the prize terms and conditions. So with that, it's time to wrap it up here. Don't forget in the handouts tab, you can still download the practical guide to the AWS well-architected framework. Uh, this is an excellent resource that was discussed uh, in detail on today's event. So make sure that you download that. It's a really well done resource uh, if you'd like to learn more about this entire series and how to best architect your AWS infrastructure for the future. And of course, watch your email inbox for an invitation to the final event in this three-part webinar series uh, where we cover um, the best, the, the, sorry, the AWS well-architected framework and, you know, with insight and discussions with uh, AWS cloud architects. So with that, it's time to wrap it up. Again, thank you so much to everyone out there in the audience for joining us on the webinar today. I hope that you learned a lot and have a great day. See you next time. Bye-bye.